finishing touch right there. Starfy, that's your new home. Oh, hello! Welcome everyone to Sweary Files, episode five. Extermination. Don't tell anyone that you saw me wearing this shirt, okay? It was laundry day over at the Hikiko home. It's already bad enough that I spent over $300 so this little box of shame can sit under the Christmas tree this year. Merry Christmas to Hikiko. Get, get up there. <laughs> oh shit, get, get up there. 2001's Extermination. I have kind of a history with this game. It was the first PlayStation 2 game that I ever rented. And unbeknownst to me at the time, it would become the first sweary game that I would have ever played. Extermination, developed by Whoopi Camp, who then dissolved into a team called Deep Space. Whoopi Camp was headed up by Tokuru Fujiwara. Tokuru Fujiwara was a living legend in the video game industry at that point, and that was around 2000. He had created games like Ghost and Goblins and Bionic Commando, and he was an executive producer on almost every single major Capcom title from the 90s until the 2000s. But he left Capcom to form his own studio called Whoopi Camp, where he created a little game called Tomba. There were two things Fujiwara was known for, his ambitious ideas and his unshakable focus when it came to game development. You see, I told you, can't be shook. A young buck sweary 65 was working at Whoopi Camp at the time. See, that's the back of his head right there. No, I promise, that's him. It is believed that sweary 65 did something on Tomba 2, but it's not entirely clear what he did. But if you were to ask me, I believe he created the Fast Pants. My name is Tomba the Mighty. I have Fast Pants. We get Turbo Pants later. Now after Tomba 2, Sweary team hopped over to Deep Space, a brand new development team that was in the same building as Whoopi Camp, where they were developing a brand new PlayStation 2 exclusive survival horror game. Now according to Sweary, he didn't have an official role when starting out with Deep Space, he just asked anyone if they needed some help and then he'd just hop in and try and help them. And eventually he built his way up into lead planner of the game midway through development. The game was actually directed and written by Yuzo Sagano, who had previously worked on another B survival horror for the Sega Saturn known as Deep Fear, which had really good voice acting. We have no idea what's going on over there. This is terrible. My masterpiece is ruined. Oh. What am I gonna do? Little known fact, Deep Space actually pitched the concept of extermination as a Deep Fear sequel, but that never got greenlit. However, some of the mutants found within extermination bear a striking resemblance to the mutants found within Deep Fear. So in many ways, extermination is a spiritual successor to Deep Fear. Reviewers at the time were accusing extermination of being a poor ripoff of Resident Evil. And yes, they share some gameplay mechanics and survival horror tropes are found within extermination shared in Resident Evil, but I wouldn't be so fast to point the accusatory finger of plagiarism at extermination if you consider that the executive producer Tokuro Fujiwara created Sweet Home, which Resident Evil borrowed most of its framework from, and if you also consider that Fujiwara was also the executive producer on Resident Evil, then yeah, extermination has some of the DNA from Resident Evil in it, but who's ripping off who in this circumstance? Extermination would also be accused of ripping off John Carpenter's The Thing, which isn't entirely fair considering The Thing is a remake of the original things, and that's not entirely original. Okay. They both take place in an Antarctic research base where an alien mutant strain goes around infecting all the people, turning them into bizarre mutants with tentacles. Yeah, there's some similarities there. And I know, this is old hat for sweary games. He's always plagiarizing something, but this time around, he's not at fault. He didn't write, he didn't direct. Please forgive sweary, it wasn't his fault. With that said, let's get into the story. Ooh. 
The story takes place on Christmas Eve of 2005. Our protagonist, Dennis Riley, is a member of Team Red Light, a band of special operations marines sent to Fort Stewart, a secret military research fort located in the middle of Antarctica, after receiving a distress call. Dennis and his BFF Roger reminisce about their dead friend Andrew, who was KIA during a mission in Cambodia. They made memorial knives and everything. Clink. We made these knives for our success in Cambodia. The trip down memory lane is short-lived as the plane inexplicably loses two engines and the Marines are forced to parachute down. This is where the game starts. You're in a tutorial area where you learn the basics of movement. I gotta give the developers credit, Dennis controls with a greater degree of freedom than most survival horror protagonists. He can run, jump, and climb in the environment with ease. This icy cliff looks impossible. Our boys find the their way into the fort via the ventilation duct, and after some Chuck E. Cheese sliding, they discover evidence of a firefight and begin the investigation. Like any good horror movie plot, the pair decide to split up, and immediately after, Dennis encounters a bunch of slug creatures that spit an infectious acid. These are known as Hydras, and they're the most abundant monster in the game. So let's talk about the combat. The primary weapon in extermination is known as the SPR-4. The 4 is in reference to all all the different components that you can hot swap on the rifle. Throughout the game, you're gonna come across various attachments to swap between. You can get like a secondary fire component, like a shotgun or flamethrower. You can swap out the scope for long range targeting or night vision. Comes with a flashlight to light up the dark. And you can control the rate of fire from single to three round burst to fully auto. You'll also come across some spare magazines to upgrade the capacity. Unlike many shooting games at the time, Extermination allowed for third person aiming with laser sights with 360 degree pivoting. One downside is the third person aiming has a forced aim assist, which makes targeting the enemy's weak points a little more difficult, and it's sometimes hard to switch between targets. But thankfully, you can just press a button and switch to first person aiming so you can better shoot the glowy spots until the thing dies. Dennis also comes equipped with a survival knife, which is mapped to the circle and square buttons respectively. He can perform a heavy diagonal swipe or a weaker combo swipe with just a button press instead of having to dip into a menu to equip it like in the early Resident Evil titles. Primarily, the knife is used mostly to dispatch the slugs, but it also serves multiple other purposes as well. You can use it to break lock locks on doors, and disarm explosive traps, which doesn't really make any sense because if you cut the tripwire, logically that should detonate the explosive, but whatever. For an early PlayStation 2 game, the movement feels surprisingly modern. It's not entirely without its flaws. I mean, sometimes the camera is too slow to reposition behind Dennis, and we'll get caught on objects when turning around, which will sometimes cause accidents to happen. And since most of the actions are mapped to the X button, for instance, jumping, well, if you press it when standing next to a ledge, you might leap forward to your death. But don't worry, these are infrequent annoyances at best. So after restoring the power, Dennis returns to the entrance to find Roger expending an infinite amount of Gatling rounds and letting all of his special ops marksman training go to waste. He doesn't manage to hit a single slug, and then he's quickly overwhelmed. Roger! Ah! Whoa! Oh, Dennis! Roger things out into a giant mutant, and before Dennis has any time to process what the hell just happened, a mysterious woman in a hazmat suit mows down mutant Roger, Rip. The lady tells Dennis to GTFO, but he don't listen, and presses forward into the nightmare. Roger, I can't believe this. In a pickle can, the goal of the game is to have Dennis fight his way through mobs of mutants and rendezvous with Team Red Light so they can band together and hopefully stop the outbreak from reaching the rest of the world. Oh, and I should mention there is this subplot where Dennis is trying to earn the forgiveness of his dead best friend Andrew's girlfriend, Cindy, and potentially cuck his dead best friend in the afterlife. Tale as old as time. 
From a glance, the level design presents itself as rather bland. It certainly doesn't have the attention to detail found in Swery's later games, but it does contain a few of his Swery-isms. For example, Bar Swery 65 makes its first appearance. Gradually, the fort gets overtaken by the infection as you progress through the story, which turns it into something truly horrific. I actually didn't mind all the backtracking in the later part of this game because you get to see the degradation of Fort Stewart with all the new pulsating flesh and beast running amok. It gives the player a sense of how bad things have gotten and how much worse it will get if the virus ever reaches the mainland and it imbues a sense of urgency to the overall mission. The atmosphere could best be described as purple and a lot of it. For the most part, you're stuck inside the drab hallways of Fort Stewart with the occasional excursion to the frozen Antarctic tundra. Dennis will find a winter jacket, which he'll then start to automatically equip any time you go outside. Now, I don't think it's possible for Dennis to freeze to death in any circumstance, even without the jacket. It's just one of those unnecessary additions put in for fun rather than to serve a gameplay function. This is true swearyism at play. I do respect that there was some consideration given to keeping the player's focus on the environment by removing almost all the HUD elements during gameplay. If you're ever concerned about Dennis's health, Health, he'll start to slump over when he's low on it, or if he gets infected, there will be a tiny little infection counter in the top right to let you know how close you are to becoming fully infected. If you want more details about his status, you can always dip into the menu, where we get introduced to the hygiene of Dennis Riley, which is another swearyism found in most of his games. You're given a rundown on Dennis's current health and infection status. When your complexion takes on the appearance of Grimace, you should probably be concerned. They wrote an internal monologue where Dennis will detail how he's feeling at the moment, presumably to guilt the player into healing him. If Dennis reaches 100% infection, he will grow a green pulsating mass on his back which will constantly be emitting poisonous gas. At this point, a life timer is set and he must run back to the nearest MTS bed to remove the infection from his body at the expense of one MTS vaccine vial. By the way, when Dennis is infected, his health is then capped at 60%, which will gradually drain until he dies. Also, water puddles around the map will cause him damage, so you gotta watch where you step on the way to the save room. Now, in terms of challenge, extermination wavers back and forth between baby's first survival horror to unfairly difficult. And that's mostly due to the boss fights, where the only strategy here is to tank a ton of damage and spend most all of your health items if you want to make it through the fight. I don't necessarily think that Extermination qualifies as a survival horror game, but more of an action game with horror set dressing. My rationale is that you're never truly put into a position where you have to manage resources for survival, with the exception of stocking up for the boss fights, because at each save room, there's an ammo depository that will fully load up Dennis's assault rifle an unlimited amount of times, so you're never pressed for ammo, you can save as many many times as you want, and there's a bed that will fully restore your health and infection if you have an MTS vaccine. The levels also don't offer too many situations where you're forced to dispatch the enemies to get to the destination. You can dodge roll past most enemy attacks or just walk your way through the mob without too much trouble. With the wide range of movement afforded to the player, you end up bypassing the need to engage with the enemies at all. There's also some bizarre mechanics that they added that almost nobody would find a practical use for. There's this mechanic where Dennis can hang from a tether if he's climbing on something, so he can aim at enemies mid-hang. Most players will never use this feature, as the game doesn't force you to make use of it. It's still cool that it's there, I suppose, but why? Just when you think the game's about to drop something clever on you, when it dishes out a new tool like this night vision scope to attach to your rifle, you'll quickly realize that it serves no practical function, and the default flashlight is better 
in every regard. There's three dark rooms in the entire game and you can just run through them and it's no big deal. Predating Metal Gear Solid 2 by just a few months, Extermination introduced a dog tag collecting bonus objective. You can find dog tags of Dennis's fallen comrades, usually after dispatching their mutant form. And if you manage to collect them all by the end of the game, you'll just get a bunch of bonus healing items in the new game plus mode. <laughs> Once again, I'm not sure why this exists, but I guess it's there if you want to do it. If you're not a fan of cryptic puzzles in your horror games, then you're in luck here because the most head scratching you're ever going to do is figuring out which door opened after you flipped a switch or making sure you charge your battery so you can open a door. That's as complicated as it gets here. Now I know all these things combined sound like I'm trashing on extermination, but honestly, it's a good entry level horror action game that if you wanted to introduce somebody to the genre, it's not a bad place to start. I can't believe that I ever found extermination to be scary. It's kind of cheesy and fun now that I think about it. But in my defense, the last time I played this was back when the game first came out and I was in middle school. At the time, I couldn't afford a memory card for my PlayStation 2. So if I died in extermination, I would have to start the game entirely over. Now, that's a scary thought. Anyways, here's the spoiler section for a 20 year old game. If you care, skip to the time code if you want to avoid them. In the last third of the game, which is three hours into the plot, all the major revelations come to the surface. The true mission Red Light was sent out to do was to destroy Fort Stewart by detonating all the bombs to eradicate any trace of the virus. However, a CIA agent was planted in the team to wipe out all the members and evidence of the operation, but they end up getting killed. It turns out the source of the infection is a giant alien turd that landed on the Earth many years ago and this mad scientist named Dr. Falcon wants to fuck it or something. I've captured the first living extraterrestrial life form known to man. Extraterrestrial? Looks like a big chunk of meat to me. This artifact is the alpha strain of the virus, so if you kill it, it will take out the rest of the hive and them's the rules. So, the team detonates all the explosives and what's left of the cast by the end of the game escape on this boat. Now before they can celebrate, they are attacked by the mutated form of Dr. Falcon, who is now merged with the alien artifact and most certainly did not die a virgin. Thus begins the most frustrating final boss fight of I've played in recent memory. This is a three-phase boss fight. Phase one, you fight a giant shrimp which randomly emerges from the water and fires homing infection missiles at Dennis and then rains down slugs too. You're supposed to jump on the back of this Jeep which conveniently has a pair of unlimited ammo cannons attached to it and you're just gonna have to use your best estimate when placing your shots. The turning is extremely sensitive and there's no sight to guide your shots. Good luck. Phase two, Falcon goes beast mode and destroys the jeep, then boards the ship where he quickly starts dropping tons of slugs, firing homing missiles, and will quickly box Dennis out if you linger too long. You're supposed to jump on some crates and then zip line over to the other side of the boat where there's this lone turret. The problem is the turret will overheat if you use it too much and you're only given a small window to shoot the beast core before you get ambushed by slugs and meat missiles. I've had this fight go south so many times before I could even land a hit on Falcon and other times I was just able to push him into the final phase without issue. It's totally random. Just try not to get too infected during this part. Phase 3, the final one is the most bullshit of them all. Out of the meaty muck comes Clone Dennis who is equipped with a rifle with unlimited ammo which he will precisely target the player eating all your health away in record time. I forgot to mention he can fire eggs filled with slugs as well, which will crack and then start to attack Dennis relentlessly at the same time. At this point, the player will likely be fully infected from the last two phases with no way to remove the infection, so they're already at a natural disadvantage from being gimped to 60 health points that's draining constantly while being shot at. I should also mention if you didn't bother to find the three pieces of the secret missile launcher throughout the game and go out of your way to collect 
collect all the secret ammo for the missile launcher, then congratulations, this is where your game ends. You need the missile launcher to beat Clone Dennis, and you're going to need to carefully space out all your missile shots so they don't get wasted on Clone Dennis's iframes. Shoot too early and they'll pass right through him. The goal is to stun lock him with missiles, and if he's not dead, just keep firing at him with whatever you have left. I don't believe it's possible to beat Clone Dennis without the missile launcher. I'm sure there's some speedrunner strat out there that I'm not aware of, guy in the comments. But under normal circumstances, in the year 2001, when this game released, if you didn't get the missile launcher, you would be stuck here and have to play through the entire game because you couldn't go back and get the missile launcher parts. They're at some points of no return. So you'd have to start the whole game over. And that's not fair. You did it. The threat is now exterminated. And Dennis cucks his dead best friend. Happy ending. Cue the out of place music to bring us all home. Candy girl, you are the sweetest candy girl. My sugar baby candy girl, the sweetest in the world. Extermination is a fairly short experience, lasting about four hours, a little less if you've played it before. Not much to do after you beat it, unless you count extra ammo and health items to be something fun. I don't. But I don't mind that a horror game is a little bit on the shorter side, but there's something about Extermination that makes me wonder what was cut in order for the game to be released on time? The development of the console wasn't completed, but I still had to make a PS2 game. By the time I'd made everything, it was over the spec. After that, SCE fixed all the specs, and we had to complete everything in eight months. Extermination was not a smash hit, and it was quickly overshadowed two months later when Silent Hill 2 released. It was pretty much a forgotten title. Members of Deep Space split off and they formed Access Games where Swery helmed as director on Spy Fiction and the rest of the members went on to make a game called Hungry Ghosts. There were talks of an extermination sequel for the PlayStation 3, but it never left the pitch stage. Anyways, before I leave you, I feel that there's one more important piece of extermination history that needs to be addressed. There are three different versions of Extermination, all released within a couple of months of each other, and there are some major differences. Let's get into them. There are three different versions of Extermination. The NTSC, aka US version that I reviewed, a PAL region version, and a Japanese version of Extermination. The North American version is probably the most unique. It sports Dennis Riley with a mullet and gray Arctic camo. They re-recorded all the voice acting from the PAL version with brand new actors and more subdued voice acting. Uh, everyone basically sounds like they're not surprised to see all the crazy things happening and there's really no energy or fun in the performance. Phileo, it's Dennis. Sorry, Sergeant Riley. Where are the others? I'll show you. I did note that the North American version of Extermination felt a little bit easier. I could kill slugs with one swipe of my knife and most enemies went down in just a few shots. And the NTSC version is the only one that has the cheesy Candy Girl love song at the very end. And then there's the PAL version where Dennis has short hair and a black military outfit. I think he looks a lot cooler in this version. I also noticed that the voice acting was great. <laughs> the air duct is here. It should lead into the compound. First, get your ass up here. Come on. This ice cliff looks impossible. There's a lot of differences in the script on the PAL version. You get to learn about Roger's backstory of growing up on the streets. Don't let your mind become clouded. Something I learned on the streets. With life comes pain. One thing I noticed here is that they tried to stretch out some of the audio in an attempt to make the dialogue sync with the lips, but they failed. <laughs> so everyone sounds like they're stoned out of their mind when delivering their lines. Gary, you all right? I was worried. Hey, I can't be beaten that easily. <laughs> nice mess you made, huh? Where were you? 
Why well, I heard a noise that came up on deck and then a giant shrimp almost threw me overboard. Oh, I'm pretty sure this was Swery's true vision for the game. I also noted that the game is a tad harder. Now slugs take two swipes of the knife and double the amount of shots. It's a more challenging game, which is something I wanted considering that there were no difficulty modes to be found. Also, the ending of the PAL version has a significantly different tone than the North American one. Instead of Dennis and Cindy riding off into the sunset, Cindy chastises Dennis, wondering where her friend is. Dennis, what happened to Sonia? Spoiler, she dead. I can't tell Cindy, no way. It would be too much for her right now. One mark against this version is they remove the awesome Candy Girl ending credits song. And then there's the Japanese version, which is kind of like a middle ground between the North American and PAL version. It still has black suit, short haired Dennis. The difficulty is still quite easy. You can kill slugs in one swipe of your knife. And I did notice that some of the items had changed from the Japanese version instead of like med kits, they're now called healing jelly. Also, I like to refer to this version of Dennis as high test Dennis. He shouts pretty much all of his dialogue. Everyone is screaming in this voice acting. <laughs> I'm kind of sad that we didn't get the Japanese dub in the North American release. It's quite entertaining. Before I close out this video, there's one more fact about extermination that I need to emphasize before I leave you. Extermination takes place on December 24th, 2005, which officially makes extermination a Christmas game. It's official. That's all it takes to be a Christmas game in this day and age. It just has to take place on Christmas, despite there being no references to the holiday or representations of Santa to be found within the game. You know, if Die Hard can get away with it, why not Extermination? Let's go ahead and add it to the Christmas games Wikipedia list. I'm about to go do, it's already there? I was just kidding. Extermination is a Christmas game according to Wikipedia? Hold up, Extermination is a Christmas game but Tomba 2 was left off the list? Santa Claus is a prominent character within that game. Tomba 2 deserves to be on the list. So confirmed Santa's number one helper is a squirrel. I would really prefer if you would be quiet. Oh, this list is complete bullshit. Extermination makes the cut, but not Blue Stinger. Need I remind you that Blue Stinger takes place also on December 24th and December 25th. There's plenty of holiday decorations, Christmas trees, and if you progress through the game and go to the ATM, Elliot will get his Christmas bonus on the 25th. And need I remind you that Santa Dog's Bower is coming to town? Blue Stinger belongs on that list. Put it on there. Elite Beat Agents. Elite Beat Agents is a Christmas game. Let me guess, it has one song that's tangentially related to Christmas, therefore it's a Christmas game? Well then by that very thin definition, you better add Dance Dance Revolution for Silent Hill, which is a Christmas song. And you know what? Since it's titled Silent Hill, it should also be entered into the canon of the Silent Hill Wiki. Dance Dance Revolution needs to be added to the Silent Hill Wikipedia. Fire up those edits. I want to see Dance Dance Revolution Christmas game, Blue Stinger Christmas game, Tumba 2 Christmas game, and then Dance Dance Revolution added to the Silent Hill Wikipedia. That is my Christmas wish. <sighs> Merry Christmas, everyone and a happy new year. Candy girl, you are the sweetest candy girl. My sugar baby candy girl, the sweetest in the world.